Hi, Floss too. So I got dressed up for you guys today. I am wearing, sort of, the lace collar that if you have been around for a while, and I had to look this up myself, but it was in my third floss tube video, I was doing a bobbin lace demonstration, and I was showing you what bobbin lace was, and I was working on this collar. And just last night, I got it off my pillow, and it took two hours to get all the pins off. It's kind of my own fault for leaving that entire task all to one time, but that's another story. But I wasn't going to let myself do a video until I got it off <laughs> so that I'd have some show and tell. Um, so the reason that I was on a time structure to get it off is that coming up next week is the LACE Convention, IOLI, International Organization of LACE, Inc. Uh, convention is coming up next week and I wanted this to wear for the uh, end of the week banquet on next Friday night. Um, and I have uh, been stressing out <laughs> on an article of clothing to put the lace collar on. Um, I am not a good clothing shopper in general. And then you add in specifics like um, solid color and a neckline that works for a collar that is not my typical neckline and it stresses me out greatly and I spent last week trying to pop into a number of different stores and tried on a bunch of things and came home with five different blouses and shirts from three different stores and last night had it narrowed down to two things and then I was almost going to do a little option A and option B for this video but I just decided that one of them, while it might work even better for a neckline, I was not going to be comfortable in that blouse. So I just decided I'm not even doing that as an option. So here's the deal. If you like this, you can go ahead and say it looks good. And if you don't, just don't tell me. <laughs> I don't think I can deal with any more shopping like this. Um, it's not attached right now, so let me just show you um, what a piece a finished piece of bobbin lace looks like um, because when you saw it it was on um, this is the the pattern in bobbin lace you call a pricking and one of the reasons you call pricking let's see if you can see here there you pre-prick the holes well many types of laces you would pre-prick the holes and that just helps guide your pin as you're going along. And so the, the pattern is often, called, you refer to it as your pricking. And so when you saw it, the lace was sitting on top of the pricking and you, you might not even really get a sense because of that, what it looks like. Um, so laid flat, so to speak, it's like this. I mean, it, it, it even could have been worn like this way. And I suppose if I found some sort of blouse that worked okay, and this shows it off better because of my hair. Oh my God, am I going to go back out shopping again tomorrow? See, one of the problems is that I hadn't, I didn't have it off the pillow, so I really couldn't even... Oh God. I couldn't even really know what I really wanted when I was in stores. Okay, this is such a stressful thing, clothing things. Here's the deal. Feel free to like comment about the lace. I, I, don't, I don't know what I want to hear about in terms of clothing options because I finally got accepted with, all right, this is the blouse I'm going to wear. I have plenty of either black or gray skirts to go with it. I mean, I, I would, once I make a decision, I will do a few um, stitches too, so that it won't like ride up on my neck, so that it actually stays attached to the um, neckline. I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about my other things, and um, we will uh, proceed with our regularly scheduled floss tube video today. So, hello everyone. How are you? Um, I feel like it's been a while since I've done... A video and I 
almost feel like I've planned way too much for this video, so we'll see how it goes and how long it goes. Um, but I'm just excited to do everything I have sitting here on my list, and I hope I will remember to keep looking at my list. Um, I have um, been working a lot on my next set of designs for my store, which has meant that I've been watching a lot of floss too, because I, I work on my laptop while I'm charting and then I have my iPad sitting next to me usually playing floss tube. I have loved um, just again continuing the parts of the community that I feel um, there's been a lot of people commenting about the importance of comments and just how that interaction matters and it matters to me. Um, I have so loved those of you and I, I cheer you on in spirit. I have so loved those of you who um, I've been getting lots of shout outs to those who are new and and because I appreciated it so much when I was new and those shout outs and I, I wish I barely keep up with those who I'm already loving and watching and wanting to interact and, and wish that I could find more time to you know do those search floss tube number one and watch those people and I wish I did um, and I feel like even those that I want to give shout outs to too many other people have already shouted them out I, I wrote a list I just want to share with all of you that I've been watching lots of great people. I went to my YouTube history, which you can't, all the way down at the bottom, I found history. You know, what were the last 15, 15 um, floss tube that I watched? So last night, when it took me two hours to pull out pins, I watched all of Jay from Mortuary Stitches and Jen Stitching Niche, which was new to me, but so many people talked about the wonderful, um, uh, interview so to speak her and her friend Teresa so consider that a shout out to a relatively newbie although that I think was like her fifth floss too but it was the first time I watched her um, those two videos together were like two hours and that's how long it took me to pull the pins out um, D squared who's also new but I, there that was their second video again two friends doing it together um, I've heard so many of you shout them out just wanted to give them an extra shout out um, just going down my list this last few days, I've watched Yvonne the Night Owl, Mischievous Stitches, Glory, Teresa Craig from Australia. I just, um, if you had not seen her needlepoint story from two or three floss tubes ago, <laughs> I loved it. And it continues on. Um, she shared in the most recent video something her son wrote in a Mother's Day card. Um, I watched Emily C. Eclectic Possessions this week. Uh, a Stitch Too Far, Cindy's Cross Stitch, Tracy P, Julie McConnell, Just Keep Stitching, Kay's Cross Stitch, Felicity Stitches, another, a new person who was shouted out by a number of you, and thank you to all those people who suggested her, she's great, um, Stitching by the Lake, and that's just my most recent 15. So while that's not anybody new and undiscovered, I just wanted to do my little part in, in, contributing to the community um, and just in the ways that I want to support um, everyone. So that's what I just wanted to share there. Okay, next on my list is um, just, oh, <laughs> this has been fun. So as I have shared things in my, the patterns that I've designed in my Etsy store, there have been ideas that have come and I say we just keep doing this. So pretty soon after my video with, um, when I did my last set of designs, and this was literally like two or three days, I had gotten a message from somebody who liked this, but asked if there was any options for another font. And, you know, when I was working on this, you know, I'd done, I think I told the story how I'd had, I wanted to do this like not work kind of border, and I was like, eh, well, and then I came up with another border, and I got it, there was, I know there was one point in my mind where I thought, I should do a different font and make it interchangeable. And then I just didn't pursue that. I made it so that the borders, like the words would fit precisely. Um, it really wasn't that much to play around with fonts and to find something that would work and fit in this size. So within like three days or so, I had updated my Etsy listings. There are now three different fonts. If you um, are interested in this pattern, but were turned off by the, the font of the writing. You go to the Etsy store right now, you will see there's a picture of these, they all fit. If you buy the PDF version, you just, you get the download of this, no problem. The only way I could figure out how to do
do it reasonably if you're buying the paper pattern. I wrote in the description. If you're interested in the if you're interested in these other fonts, please put a note, and I'd be happy to email you the PDF. Um, if that doesn't work for you, you know you don't have access to a printer. You are just solely a paper pattern person. It's a deal breaker for you. You know, contact me. The problem is, is that this pattern is so many pages to print out. But if you know which border you want, and you'd much rather have the pages that have extra fonts than a border you're not going to need, I wouldn't be much. I'd be happy to print out these pages than an extra border. So, talk to me. Um, because this happened so soon after that, I know I contacted the people who bought the PDF. And now I'm questioning, because I know I had just put things in the mail, and I know I wanted to, I was planning to email the people who had bought the paper, and then I thought, no, I should wait a day or two until they get it in the mail. Anyway, anybody want this file with the other fonts? Oh, where's my handy dandy card? It got buried. I should always have it handy. Works by ABC at gmail.com. Okay. Um, so I have a cross stitch finish. I have posted this on um, uh, uh, Stitch Mania and on Instagram. This is the flowers and swirls pattern. That I designed. I did it in the colors which were uh, Weeks Dye Works that are on the pattern. I like the way, particularly the purple flowers. I mean to me that's, well I guess in this cranberry color too, but it's really the purple flowers that it affects the most. So I mean my gut opinion is if you stay away from over dyes for whatever reason, it costs whatever, it's Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, where is it most effective? You know, maybe you only do it in one place or another. And in this pattern, it, it might only be the purple flowers. So, um, and right before I started to film, I just wanted to share this with you. So when I was stitching, I don't know if it's upside down. Yeah, no, this is the way. It's it's completely symmetrical. It almost doesn't matter which way you hold it. Um, so while I was stitching, I realized somewhere, okay, there was a, a mistake I made. Can you see that one yellow stitch there? But it is not filled in there. And it's not filled in up here. It's not filled in in the pattern. Like when I was doing the yellow down here, I, I wasn't looking at the pattern. I just went ahead and filled it in. And at some point I realized that I filled it in here, didn't fill it in there. Oh, I need to fix that one way or the other. I didn't. I didn't take out that stitch. I didn't put in this stitch. Um, and I just forgot about it until I was, you know, bringing it up here, getting ready to, to film. And um, I don't know if I will. So... I know there are various um, sayings, and they come from different cultures. I know, I'm almost positive, there's one that's from like a Native American culture, I think from like an African st cultural standpoint, from maybe even a Chinese standpoint. The idea of all your work, whether it be a quilt or a stitching, or a, your work, should there should always be an imperfection. Um, and sometimes that's because it, it's supposed to be, you know, godly or something, and whatever. That, that there's always some imperfection in your work. And sometimes you know that there's an imperfection in your work, and sometimes you don't. Um, and uh, this is just an imperfection that, I mean, you, you couldn't. You'd have to stare at it. Now, of course, you all know it because I pointed it out to you. Anyway, I haven't decided whether or not I'm going to pull out that yellow stitch. Um, and I was asked by someone about how am I going to finish it, and that is an excellent question. Um, and it's kind of, I need, I need to figure some things out. I'm trying to figure out where I would like to go with this designing work. I'd like to go as far as I can go. I think you all know, I think I've said it even if I haven't said it, that 
while a few things I've designed are based off of things I've created, and, and there's definitely some things that I'm working on at the same time, mo the designs that I'm putting out, you know, what you see on the front covers are, are a computer-generated stitch. And I know that you buy some patterns that are like that. The majority that are out there, um, certainly historically, a model was stitched, and then you... Um, and then a pattern was created with a picture of the finished thing. And so I need to think about when it comes to anything that I have finished, that I've stitched, that, that I will now, I can say, have a model of one of my designs. Um, I need to think about what I'm going to do with it in a finishing kind of way that it might be useful for some future thing. I, I think about those trunk shows that Needleworkers Delight, that the LNS that I... Um, brought my last video on. You know, how they have trunk shows. Will there be a day that maybe I'll have trunk shows? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But, um, so I'm not in a rush to finish, finish this only because I want to think carefully what that's going to be. So, there you go. Okay. Next on my list, I would like to share a mystery with all of you. This is a good one. I'm not expecting any solutions, and frankly, th there's nothing you can propose as a solution to this mystery that will make any sense, so we're just, we're just going for it. Um, in, I think this is also the last time you saw this was my third floss tube video. Um, a few months ago, and basically I stopped working on this when I started working on the whole idea of an Etsy store and designs and stitching for that. I showed you, it was, it is a, I'm going to give you a little preview, it's, where are the measurements, 30 inches, it's a 30 inch square, and the center part of it, there we go, the center part is like a, a 14 count Ada and it's like a lace looking design. And again, for those of you that have seen earlier videos, maybe you're like, oh yeah, she hasn't shown that in a while because I haven't worked on it in a while. So, the true story. Please tell me, you all do this, that you have things like thrown around and then you get a phone call that someone's stopping by, just stopping by in 10 minutes to drop off something and you're so embarrassed by how everything looks that you, in a whirlwind, grab a whole bunch of stuff and shove it in a closet. I did that. This was months ago. And so one of the things was this project in its Q-snaps, and I wasn't actively working on it at that time. It was when I was starting up on stitching with Etsy-related stuff. And all this stuff, including this project, went into my bedroom closet. I have a walk-in closet. It doesn't make any sense. It just went in there. And then everything looked so nice and neat. I kind of left a bunch of stuff in the closet because I had the space to leave it in there. And at some point, I was like, I should take the Q-snaps off of it, and I did. And I kind of folded it up. Not kind of. It was folded up, and there was a piece of, um, like, muslin cloth, cotton fabric just sitting over it. It was the fabric that had been like a, like a dust cloth over it, and I just put that in there. And it was sitting, basically, on top of something else, on top of my sweaters in my closet. And... A few weeks ago, I was at Needleworkers Delight. Someone who was there had asked me about this project. I'm like, oh, I haven't worked on it. I'll bring it the next time I come. So that day that I was filming, I, for the first time in three months, I took it out of the closet. And I just got to open it up just to remind myself how far along I went. I had gotten. Now, I don't know if this is going to show up on camera. Can you see the stain? You, it's like this, I mean, it almost looks like a, um, like a bleach kind of stain. And, um, it's, it's worse on the back. It's definitely worse. The worst part of it, oh, there, that, that gives you a good view. It, it looks like something like liquid spilled. And it was folded it up so you could almost like picture the pattern. It looks like something spilled. And um, 
I can't for the life of me figure out, based on where it was sitting in my closet, how this possibly could have happened. Now, amazingly, the majority, and this is partially how it was sitting in the, how it was folded up, where the stitching is really was not affected. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not like, I'm not devastated by this. I What I am going to do is I am going to try washing it with wool light. I brought, when I brought it in, um, Jim at um, the store who does all the dyeing work, you know, he looked at, he said, what is that? I, I couldn't figure it out. You know, they, the first, I'm going to try washing it with wool light. And I, I didn't do it yet because I was waiting to show all of you guys. And maybe next video I'll have, you know, this is my before and I'll have an after to show you and it will all look perfectly fine. Um, and if it doesn't come out, I don't know. I don't know what I will do. And it, it, it's just the oddest thing. So it's a mystery. I don't know. There, there's nothing in the vicinity of that, of anything in the closet that was liquid that could have spilled on it, which is what it looks like. But there you go, your mystery of the day. Next up on my list. Okay. In so many ways, I think if you have started watching Floss 2, no, a little tickle. Um, I can say that I have been influenced by Floss 2 watching in so many wonderful ways. Um, and this next thing on my list is absolutely one of them. So a week ago, over a week ago, it's a Saturday, I didn't have any specific plans. I, was, I don't know if I was working on my lace or whatever. And I just got finished watching somebody who was showing yet another thrift store find. And I said, okay, I've had it. I got to give this a try. I've never, real, I've never been a thrift store person. I've gone to like antique malls you know, where they have the booths, which some of you refer to when you're talking about thrift stores, and it kind of depends on junkin' and, and where you're going. And I like to, like, wander through those kind of places. I almost never buy anything. And there's none of those really near me. And a thrift store I've never been to, certainly not in this area. Although, so, I googled thrift store near me, found three, got in my car and went. <laughs> now, this story is for everyone who says, I never find anything in my thrift stores. So I did, I realized one of the places I went to, I'd been once before a few years back with another teacher. We were looking for like co costume parts for students for a school thing. And she's like, oh, we have to go to this place. And sure enough, we found plenty of like clothing items that would work for kids for it. But beyond that, I really hadn't been to any of these places. All three of these places, no craft corner, no like, golden hole, no like, no dusty bags of 20 year old Ada from the craft store, nothing like that. My three visits, the sum total of any craftiness whatsoever, there was a bag, like plastic bag of like very, very basic yarn. There was a old 80s cheapo how to embroider kit. And then there was this gem, like, out of nowhere, you wouldn't believe this. I have to pull back for you guys to see this. It is a needlepoint on a stand. The stand is um, like completely convertible in a in an old-fashioned kind of way. In none of the fancy stuff that a lot of stands have nowadays. It's you know undo the wing nuts and there's all the sizes here the frame part that the needle point is on is just scroll rods that just tighten with wing nuts and loosen you could put it in here and here. I mean I, um, it's a very basic it's lightweight but the wood is um you know, like it's stained and varnished kind of wood it's not the I don't know what you call it and from these holes here like it looks like they're 
the side parts have been moved. It looks like it has been used. The needlepoint part, so you get the effect. You totally get the effect. Okay, wait, Nate, I have to show you this to prove to you. I left the price tag on. Oh, can I get the camera to focus? $3.99, people. $3.99. Now, I am not one, like I said, I don't go to thrift stores that often. I, I don't, I couldn't leave this there, okay? I just couldn't. So now, what I want to do, I'm, I'm trying to unroll it, which is just, I'm just turning this so that you can see. Oh, okay, so yeah, I need to do this. So it, it, the way it's held on is just by tacks. And I pulled off most of it. I'm going to pull off the last two tacks. And now, so here's the interesting thing. It doesn't look like at least these bars were used that much because there aren't that many tack holes in these bars. There's at least one other set, but not multiples of sets. So I'm going to unroll this so that you all can see this needle point that was left on here. And um, and um, if you turn it around, you could see how much was done. It's like more than a third, but not a half. You know, something like that, you would say. Now, the canvas that was on here, those who are not familiar with it, I mean, this is a painted needlepoint. It's not hand-painted. It's like a printed kind. And this is, I'm pretty sure it's called Penelope um, canvas because it's um, this, like, double weave thing. And I don't know or understand why other than some sort of manufacturing reasons, why canvas could be made or why it's made like this. Um, I suppose you, um, it could be helpful if you were doing some one, -on one over one areas. The person who worked on this was not doing any one over one areas. The yarn that's on here, there's this little piece hanging off here. I'm not really super good with, I, this feels like cotton. It doesn't feel like wool to me. Um, and that's what I'm, you know, is I feel what's done. So here's the deal, folks. I would love to give this to somebody. If there is somebody out there on Floss Tube World that would like to stitch this, I don't know the chances of finding somebody who would. I know most of you don't do painted canvas, printed canvas kinds of things like this, um, but I thought I'd give this a try. I know that I will not stitch this. Um, I just would love to find somebody that would. The options for finishing it, either you're picking out, you know, all the stitching and starting fresh, or, you know, what isn't done it's like very convenient what is done that you could get some yarn some thread and it would look perfectly fine this shows you how many colors are involved which isn't that many and it's not like you really have too many areas that need to match up to other areas like none of the tree is done so you're like starting fresh with all tree area i mean the most that you would have quote a problem with is like this little bit of green area here so you might pick out that little green to want it to match something else, but maybe not. Like, I really think it was stocked at a very doable place that it could be picked up, even if it was with some different kinds of thread or yarn. Um, the name here and the name of the um, print scene, uh, I don't know, which I think is the panther scene. So I was able to look this up. You can find this canvas online. Uh, there's a website called needlepointus.com. Ironically, they have often been 
an ad that shows up on the side of Yahoo and Facebook and stuff. And now that I've actually been to their site, they're really showing up. Um, they still sell the canvas. It's, they sell it for $118 for the canvas alone. I also saw this canvas on eBay, the Canadian eBay for $89.99, a U.S. eBay for $65. Um, the $65 on the U.S. had the canvas plus tapestry wool. Um, you could go on the needlepointus.com website. They were charging $118 just for the canvas, but then they are offering threads with it. I mean, with a little bit of research, and I would be happy to help to the extent that I could. If you were dedicated to doing this, you could find some thread. Um, so again, I don't know the chances of finding somebody watching me right now who would like this. I would love to give it to somebody. Um, to give it to somebody who's going to stitch it, please, please don't just try and sell it on eBay. I could do that. I would much rather give it to somebody who's going to stitch it. If you have any interest, please, you know, comment below. Um, I would love to start a conversation about it. I want to go to a good home. Um, go there. So, if nothing else, you know, thrift store find of the year, three ninety nine. Well, all right, we can argue that because plenty of you have found plenty of good finds. But I admit, I am kind of afraid to try going anywhere else. I um. I, there's a, I, um, I do a, a number of tutoring things during the summer just for money. <laughs> and um, one of the kids I tutor, I meet at a library a little bit off my beaten path. And I, I started Googling thrift stores near that area just because it's a little bit further west of me. And sure enough, a little bit further west of that, there'd be a couple more places to go. And I thought, mm, maybe one afternoon. I'll, and I just thought, I will never get anything like that. But lesson learned people you will never know never know until you give it a try okay next thing on my list a few floss tubes ago i um had somewhat randomly commented although it really was on my list somewhere somewhere i have a list of all the things i could potentially talk about on floss tubes um although i've been checking it off uh, I commented about doing a books a bookshelf tour, and that's what I want to do right now. Um, so I always film sitting in this spot, uh, and you can see behind me. There's this set of shelves here that um, you know I'm just proud of the things that I've collected in these spaces. I'm also gonna clue you in to what comes next. So over in the corner is a, a corner shelf. It's actually, you know, three small shelves that form a corner there. Um, in those containers are a lot of supplies of all kinds of things. They are um, threads and fabric. They extend beyond my needlework world. I've done a lot of like paper arts stuff, not not scrapbooking, so to speak, but some of the same kinds of tools you would use for scrapbooking things. Um, you can see sewing stuff is down there, um, scroll bars. Um, so, and then over, this way. That shelf over there, you can't tell, there are um, containers that have fabric, and it's not like, um, like cross-stitch fabric, it's like fabric fabric for like quilting and um, sewing Halloween costumes for my niece and nephews and stuff like that. And, uh, and also paper, like origami paper, which also is a part of my paper arts world. You could see hanging on the wall. Sorry, I'm crooked. I've shown you those needlework. Ooh, let me just comment about that light switch right there. I have no idea what that light switch does. And that's part of the story of the space that I'm sitting in right now. 
So I film up here. It's a loft space where I live. Um, it's a complex of like townhouse comp uh, condos kind of thing. I live, I come up to the second floor. I come in to my home and then this space is like a third floor. It's a, it's a loft space. I don't have a first floor. It's, it, I live on the second floor plus I have this space, which is a loft space. I don't know how like the people who also have this loft space, how they use it because because it's an open space, it looks down to the living room space. You can't close it off to have like a a bedroom up here. You can't close it off to have a even like a you know game room or a man cave or you, it's just not a closed off space. So how people use it is very interesting. How I've used it is like a um, studio space. I don't do much stitching up here. It is very much a, um, uh, it's a studio space, but it's not really where I stitch. I do my lace work. I do lots of other work sitting at this table. I have all my stuff around me. So when I moved here, I moved here mm, nine years ago. Um, I was so excited that I was going to have this space dedicated. I had two of those corner things and one big shelf in my bedroom. So another important piece to know is all these shelves are Ikea shelves. Somebody, um, somebody commented in a video about um, my shelves are, and they might have been referring to just, it's nice to see used shelves, meaning they were being well used, but they might have also been referring to like, they thought they were antique or something. No, they're Ikea shelves. But it was it was easy enough to add more to them. And actually, this center section was an add-on since the years have passed. And actually, over there, you could even see I extended upward. Those are extra parts up there. I could even extend an upper part up here, but I'm fighting that because I don't think it looks that great. When I moved in here, I wanted to have like a whole space, a library kind of space. Um, there's like a showroom in Ikea that they have like, you know, these bookshelves like set up like as a library space. And I just thought that was the best looking thing. And it doesn't need to be books filled, uh, a space filled with books of like novels and reading. It's just about having things that you treasure near you. Um, the reason for that empty space there and the empty space that you see right here is that there are vents in the floor for the um, heating and air conditioning. So I can't have a full wall of bookshelves. Um, so I needed to explain that. The other thing you need to know when it comes to like Ikea bookshelves or really any that you build is that with their height, there needs to be one shelf. I'm so not answering that. Um, there needs to be one shelf that is um, nailed in. The rest of them are, um, you can adjust. But the one that, the, the way it was is that once I put in what needed to be put in, which is this right here, this guy right here. And recognizing that most of the things that I wanted to put on my shelves were not like the height of reading books. That I needed more space between shelves. So it didn't work out to have, you know, the right, it just didn't work well. But then it came, like when I was trying to decide, this was the space, like I was creating my own space here. How did I want to use it? And at first I was just like, well, I'll have five shelves instead of four, or excuse me, instead of six. Um, but then it became, well, what, what could I do with a narrow space like this? So these containers right here, now there's a bunch of other crap in there, but so these three containers are where I have DMC floss. So the other things that are over there are the non-DMC threads, but over here is where DMC ended up. And so that became its own little space right there. I continued that space over and um, just for the visual look of it. Okay, so let me tour you around so you can follow somewhat my organization of things. On this side here, these side, these are all needlework of all kinds. So oh, let me let me do this. Let's see if I can do this right. 
top shelf, I'm not particularly tall, so the top shelf becomes like the not so important books. I'll get to those in a moment. So these two shelves are sort of the most important of the needlework books. Up here are a lot of um, like stitch dictionaries, different types of stitching, uh, stitches, um, and that's not just for like needlepoint stitches, it's, it's all kinds of stitches. Um, over here is a little bit more types of needlework. So I've got gold work, I've got um, black work, I've got you know, the different kinds right there. Up there become a lot of books that aren't so, so important, but yet a lot of them are, they're laying this way because this is what happened when I needed the taller shells here and here, there just wasn't enough room to have a tall shelf up there. This shelf, obviously, just continuing, I just needed a small shelf here. These books are actually the ones that I usually use when I'm filming a floss tube video, and I, I put them for my laptop to sit on. But because I was doing this today, I wanted it to look the way it usually looks. Um, I brought some books up from upstairs. Um, so sort of like the coffee table looking books, but they're related to this kind of thing. So they belong up here, not downstairs. This is a lot of my... Um, what I call ideas, ideal folders. Down here, so just in the way that there's organization to everything and yet the organization isn't perfect. <laughs> so this stack, including these boxes, has a lot of like scrapbooking paper. And again, it's not about making scrapbooks. It's about using those that kind of paper to make cards, to make things like that. Um, the paper art stuff that I was talking about, that included a period of time where I was doing bookmaking. So, and this is, I ran out of space, but um, like these are books that I made. Um, th this was at a course where there was the right like machines and tools. I could talk about that some other time. Um, what I'm going to do is get you closer because there's some specific things I'd like to point out. So one thing, and maybe you could even see this from a distance. I have two copies of a book that kind of stand out here. Um, the Complete Encyclopedia of Needlework. This is Therese Dilmont, which is like the DMC uh, historical person. You know, and this is a key. This was this copy, which is a, a soft cover, was given to me years and years ago by uh, a colleague at the first school I taught at, and. She gave it to me for a, a school-related thank you, but she wrote this very nice note in it and said, you need to own a copy of this. This copy was given to me just a few years ago by a, a sweet, kind person, and I, you know, I, what can I say? I didn't need a second copy of it. It would happily go in the donation pile, except she wrote such a nice note inside. And so this is why it kills me <laughs> when I am at book sales and I see people, I see beautiful um, inscriptions in books and I just, I can't get rid of it because it's got such a nice inscription, even though the relationship with the giver isn't super important to me. I just realized I forgot to tell you guys about a really important thing that's related to all of my stuff. So for a very long time, I was trying, I was trying to think about this and I'm going to say at least 12 years, and it might be more than that. Um, I have volunteered at a very large used book sale. They claim it's the largest book sale on the East Coast. You can make, you know, your arguments about that. Um, and it takes place in Princeton, New Jersey. <laughs> um, and uh, all the money raised goes towards scholarship funds for student, local students. What's amazing about this sale, so it fills, fills an entire high school gym, high school, like, lunchroom, cafeteria, and, like, a third space as well. And all those books at the end of the sale are gone. Like, last day, you know, $5 a bag, whatever, and then, and then they bring in, like, donation places, and, and they are gone. And they start fresh every year. And they accumulate that many more books. Um, so I have volunteered to work this sale 
and I like to volunteer for the setup days. So what they do, they have a donation place and they have, I mean, this is all like various people donating all kinds of ways. They have storage units and they, people drop off at a donation place and then as they need, they start getting storage units of boxes. They sort at the donation place. So things go in like the fiction box and the children's box and the hobbies box. So hobbies becomes this catch-all category. Hobbies includes like puzzles and games and like chess and you know that kind of stuff. It includes um, all the needlework, all the cross stitch, all the knitting. It includes a lot of stuff. It's a catch-all category. They will acknowledge that. So those boxes get put into storage. As the year goes on, the sale happens in March. Um, the school, they rent out the school during the school spring break. And there's this massive setup for five days where those boxes come in, they need to be unloaded. They've now got, the, the system is pretty good about the setup time um, and pricing and stuff has gotten to be much easier. So it's it's mostly standard prices, which are like one, I think it's one and two dollars, two and three, no, one and two, whatever, cheap stuff. Anyway, so I volunteer during the setup time and not so much during the sale time. And for most of those 12 years, I've been in charge of the hobbies. And what that means is I unpack all the boxes. And what that means is I get first dibs of all those books. Now, after doing this for so many years, there's, you know, there isn't that much temptation. You know, I, I know what I want and what I don't want. I know what's going to be useful and what is not. I know what I already have and what I don't already have. There's so many books, and not so many. A few times people on FlossTube have shown a book or something they've gotten, and I say to myself, yep, saw that at the book sale. Um, just because, so what you need to picture, a standard folding table, three feet by six feet, eight feet, whatever those standard folding tables are, usually hobbies gets assigned is it four or six of those? I'm trying to picture. Filled. Like, filled. I stand them all up. I organize them. Like, that's what I'm known for, that I do a really good job at, I put together all the knitting books. I put together all the crossword puzzle books. I put together all the, you know, whatever, so that there is some organizational sense to that giant hobby area. Where I'm going with all this is that some of the things I have on my shelf have come from the sale, and some of them have come from years of working on the sale, and what, where, um, and where, why I was reminded to talk about this are these books right here. So, Erica Wilson was a um, prolific, I guess you would really call her embroidery, cruel, all kinds of, I mean, not not so much cross stitch. She came from England. She was a graduate of the Royal School of Needlework. Her her time was the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And um I think she she had like a, a television show like the same time period that Julia Child had her like PBS television show. I just know these little pieces from knowing history. So these Erica Wilson books, which are like from the 70s, would come through the book sale like every year. And every year, I, they're, they mean nothing to me. Erica Wilson died in like 2012 or so. And I remember that year when those books came through thinking, hmm. Because it was, it was known enough in the needlework world that I was following. Blogs, websites, groups, so on. Huh, I wonder if I should pick them up and try to sell them on eBay. I did. This past fall, I went to this wonderful needlework symposium at a place called Winterthur, which I'm going to talk more about in a minute. And one of the sessions that I went to was about Erica Wilson and really her legacy and what her importance was. And I just learned so much and had so much appreciation. So this past March, when sure enough, Erica Wilson books came through when I was opening boxes, you know, for, and got four of her books. It was a no brainer. And it's not that I've even used these books or looked that much at these books. It was more of a, an appreciation of them. So another thing that comes from the book cell, I'm wondering how many people in here, 
you've ever seen this book. And the reason why I pointed it out, because this was something I learned early on. Yeah, I remember seeing this book. This one's a crappy copy, but whatever. Can you see the author? Rose Wilder Lane. That's the daughter of Flora Ingalls Wilder. And a few, um, I feel like more than one person in Floss Tube has recently talked about, like in the 20 Things About Me, a love of Laura Angus Wilder. And her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, had a really interesting life. Um, and one of the last things she did was this book, a women, Women's Day Book of American Needlework. There is also a, um, a box of patterns that goes with this. And that box has come through the book sale some years also. I've never picked it up. I've never decided to purchase it because it almost always is in pretty lousy condition. I have no interest in the patterns. And the box is usually pretty thick. And let's face it, my bookshelves are pretty full. So I, get, I start to get a little picky about what I am getting. Um, so I, I just wondered if you are seeing anything. So like I said, here's some like stitch dictionary, oops, like stitch dictionary kind of books, kind of, sort of, the topic on that shelf. And down here, like over here is some like exhibits kind of, or like, oh wait, I need to point this one out. Look, McKenna has this book. <laughs> this was, uh, it was like on the thumbnail of one of her videos. And every time, sometimes you see things or, or YouTube says, watch this one again. I always want to say, McKenna, I have your book. Um, or this, oh, here's a really neat treasure. A friend of mine went to Italy her stepsister bought a something, an old home there, found in the drawer these Hardanger books in Italian. They're old. She had, the, the stepsister had no need or desire to have them. My friend took them to give them to me. And then I was able to, through the wonders of eBay, find the exact same books on the English versions of the exact same books, obviously newer editions of them on eBay, you know, treasures. So different types. So, um, so there's hard anger books, there's white work, black work, gold work. If you see anything that you at a future time would want me to talk more about, you know, just leave it in the comments. Um, Oh, there's so many things I was going to point out, but I'm already seeing how long this is already going, and I still have more to talk about. Down below, the whole bottom shelf is filled with both magazines and patterns. And those magazines, I really need to do something, because most of, like a whole bunch of these and over there are EGA and ANG, Embroiderers Guild of America and American Needlepoint Guild. And it's about time that I need to go through, am I ever going to read or look at anything in these and then do something? I don't think there's anything anyone's going to want like to sell them. I'm not sure. The gray ones for a minor amount of color coding starts me talking about lace. So, and it, that kind of spills out over there. So down here, these are laces just because it fits sideways. So let me go back up here. So now... This whole shelf and this whole shelf, yeah, these are all lace books. And this whole shelf and this whole shelf. Yeah, I got a lot of those. I got too many. But I still like them. Up there on this side, these are all... Sorry. Um, these are just needle lace, which is not something I've explored too much. Over here is tatting. But yeah, all of this bobbin lace of various kinds. Yeah. Oh, down there, I'm getting crooked here. 
Here's my quilting section. Not too much. And then that's kind of like a spillover. That's more needlework things. These are more um, recent, I would say patterns. It's not so much like cross stitch patterns that a lot of you guys are showing in, in very cool videos, mind you. It's more like these are my wish I had time to do it projects that I just haven't gotten to yet. Down here is where I have some cross stitch and other related patterns. Here. Now there were a few things I was going to pull off the shelf to show in person. Oop. That's right. This was one thing. So those two copies of, of the um, complete book of needlework, the Diet Therese Dumont. So this was a little treasure from the book sale one year. I mean I recognize the title. It's it's little. You could see it in relation to my hands. Um, it is an old, old cop. There's no date on it. It, it says, the encyc this encyclopedia of needlework is published in English, French, German, and Italian. Number of copies issued until now, 750,000. Um, but look, it came from the sister library. It came from like a convent. It's from the sister's room. And I got it for $2. I mean, the fact that it had a price on it meant somebody at the um, collection area, before the books came into the main cell, at some point during the year, somebody looked at this, double-checked that it wasn't worth a lot, confirmed that it wasn't worth a lot, put a price on it. Oh, that reminds me, in terms of worth a lot. For those of you who like to look uh, for uh, books, so this is... Um, what I will call my best treasure ever from the book sale. It's called Bottoms of Belgium. It's, oh, I can't open it because I've got, I'm going to say the publication is 1920, but it might be 20 something, okay? I could not believe, Charlotte Kellogg is the author, could not believe the year, the, the day that I opened the box, unpacking things, found this. If you guys are ever in some store and you see a real version, like a clearly 1920 something book of this and not a recent reprint, I could promise you I could find lots of lace makers who would love to buy this. This is like a nonfiction account of what happened to the Belgian lace makers after World War I and how they survived. And it's, it's a really interesting read. I'm losing my lace collar here already lost it. All right. um, it's a really interesting read just about the devastating effects of World War I. And um, it's a book that has been, yeah, 1920. It's a book that has been um, like reissued, I guess you'd say, in the 2000s in that way that you like book on print on demand kind of thing. Like if you were to right now look up eBay or used booksellers, you'll see it show up. And you'll see it show up for like $40, $50. And it's really unclear whether it's a real copy of the book or a really like reprinted copy of the book. And I know more than one lace maker that has been convinced that they're getting a real copy of the book and has basically gotten like that redone version, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, if you ever see a copy, I mean, don't spend lots of money for it. I got that. Look, this one came in. And again, somebody looked at it, somebody took the time, and I could not believe. Six dollars? Like, the person who put a price on this didn't know what they, this book, there's a treasure room. There's a treasure room where they have, they, they have real treasures. They put, they, it's, it's a locked room. Only a certain number of people can go in at a time for the sale. Um, I mean, in some respects, if they put this in there, no one would have bought it. It's only a certain population that would have been interested in it. But, um when I have told lace makers that I have a real copy of Bobbins of Belgium, they're like, where'd you get it? Okay. I, this is taking way too long and yet I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Even if you guys are getting bored with me, I hope you're not. So I just wanted something else I meant to take off the shelf, which is this, which is leading to something else as I'm still not even following. What else was I supposed? Oh. <laughs> 
Do I keep going? Do I just make this a long video? I guess I have to. Okay, so this is a book I just pulled off the shelf because I want I needed to do this. So I mentioned briefly about Winterthur. I wanted to show you that um, this is a book I have about Winterthur. I've had, this was there was a book that was um, one of my library systems has a copy of this. When I first learned about Winterthur, I know that I'd gotten this book out. It's just about some of the needlework Winterthur has. If you've never heard of it, it is a home in Delaware, and I mean, it's about an hour and a half from me. This picture does not do it justice. I have this book on it because when I first discovered it, it's just a fascinating place. Um, Henry DuPont, you know, more money than you know what to do with kind of time. And um, There's no picture in here, because I looked, to give you a sense of just how big this place is, because it doesn't look like a palatial mansion from the outside. He was a collector. You know, he had more money than he knew what to do with. He cared about um, the beauty and gardening. Gardening is just makes it sound so small. The grounds of his land. He cared about decorative arts. His particular interests were from 1620 to 1820, like before the Industrial Revolution. And um, oh, and a, a farming. Like he had like a working. Um, cow farm also. Anyway, you, it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, I first learned about it from needlework things, but I've been there for other, I wish I lived closer because they have some pretty amazing like events and lectures and stuff going on. Why am I telling all of you this? Because a few videos ago, videos ago if you happen to be watching our wonderful McKenna, she shared with you all a book that she had picked up. Now, she had shared that book on a post in Facebook and uh, in Citromania, I'm pretty sure she was on vacation and she was showing look what books needlework books I found at a bookstore and I couldn't believe a book that I saw she had a book that's called needlework masterpieces from Winterthur and that's a book that has sat in my Amazon wish list for the longest time now I use my Amazon wish list like a don't forget about the existence of this book. It's, it's like maybe I'll get around to purchasing it someday. You can get used copies of it. Not too difficult. At least they exist. Um, I just, it just wasn't something I had actually gotten around to doing. And I saw that picture and I responded, holy crap. <laughs> I, I think I even said something kind of rude like, are you planning on keeping that? <laughs> Which was... Thank you, McKenna. She is so sweet. She gifted me this book. And it goes with the other Winterthur things I have. And it goes with the interest that I have in taking things of beauty and translating them to needlework, which is what this person did, does. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you to McKenna for giving me this book, for giving me her find. Um, because of all my, I mean, this is the thing, of all the years of working at the book sale, I've seen a lot of books come through. I know this would have been one I would have picked up even before I ever found it on Amazon. Although this has, I've never seen this. And somehow it made it to her side of the country, way far away from Winterthur. So thank you. Thank you. Oh dear. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to show you. I'm only going to do part of this. This is so, um, I will take some other video time to talk about more of this. But I'm just going to do a short part right now because just a few videos ago, I can't even keep track. Um, Mary Rose from Stitch Bliss Corner was, was doing a video where she mentioned the Bayou Tapestry. And um, up there, on my shelf, this little area is mostly things that come from this amazing trip that I had in 2012 to France. I'm not a traveler in the world, um, but that was an amazing trip. It was with a group. It was focused on needlework and lace. And I think I'll, I'll share more of it in some other time if some people are interested. But let me just take a brief moment right now to say that I had the opportunity to go see the Bayou Tapestry in Bayou. In France and I wanted to show you all that in the town 
By the way, if anyone is going there, I have a strong recommendation of a hotel to stay in because we stayed in the most adorable, amazing place. But in the town, and I looked this up online, the store still exists. There is a woman. Um, this is like my binder of souvenirs, cards, and brochures and stuff. She runs a store. This is, this is her. Um, Chant Chantal James. And her mission in life is to, it's, it's not just about preserving the Bayou Tapestry's work, because there's plenty of books, there's plenty of images that still exist. It's about the embroidery and the, the stitch of it. So she has created, this is sort of like a kit, yeah, this is like her catalog, or at least a partial catalog, of she has taken, you know, the images which you can find online or whatever, and she has created the stitching that was used in the Bayou Tapestry is a, is a four-part stitch, and, and it's, it's called the Bayou, embroidery, Bayou stitch. And so you, when you do these four parts, it's called the Bayou stitch. And her mission is to make sure people know how the Bayou Tapestry was stitched. And so she sells kits, and she wants you to learn how to do the Bayou Tapestry. If you're going to do a reproduction of the Bayou Tapestry, do it right, I guess is the mission. So as part of our day there, we went to her shop. You could purchase a kit and have a little mini lesson. I mean, you almost didn't even need a lesson because as long as you could follow instructions, it wasn't that difficult. Um, I didn't want. I didn't get the small, small kit. I did get the largest because I knew this wasn't a type of stitching that I was going to love, but I loved the spirit of it. So this was my choice. Um, not my colors, but again, it was about the right size of kit. It was a griffin, and this and uh, this this like this isn't even worth framing. So it just stays in my souvenir binder. And if you can see the stitching on that, you know it's not cross stitching. It's not like Mary Rose was working on a um, like a cross stitch of an image. You can find you can find those kinds of things. What this woman does with her kits, with her designs, again, it's just, it's, it, and I think she's expanded beyond the Bayou Tapestry to a few other things, but the type of stitching is intended to be reproducing the type of stitching that is on the Bayou Tapestry. So I wanted to make sure to get that in in this video because it was sort of, sort of timely to Mary Rose's, um, and it was literally just about five years ago. I just um, had dinner with a friend of mine who was on that trip. We were sort of celebrating our five-year anniversary of being friends because that's where we met. Um, there were other things I was going to talk about on that from that trip, but um, I'm going to wait because I am already over an hour, and I didn't even get to Mother Lace stuff. But I need to get to that because that's timely too. Are you guys still with me here? I hope. I'm going to start talking about lace now. Lots of people have given me feedback that they like this, but if you are somebody who is done, thank you for coming. <laughs> so, um, and I just realized I didn't completely gather my things. So I'm just going off camera for a minute, but something is sitting over here and passing through. Something is sitting over here and now look, I am going down to the containers because they are the um oh no there's something something downstairs well you know what this is already long enough I'm gonna I'm gonna show you these parts right now and there might be a follow-up to this okay so this coming weekend, I am going to be going to the IOLI convention. I briefly mentioned this quite some time ago. So this year, it's not quite like going away, away for me. It is only, only. It is in the general Philadelphia area, which the actual hotel place is in King of Prussia, which is like in the considered the north 
northwestish suburb area, um, which takes me like an hour and a half, which is great. I can drive there. I can bring as much stuff as I want. Um, I feel very lucky that I'm able to do this. This is my only vacation of the year. Um, it's like going to camp. I'm going to camp. And that's what a lot of people say. Um, I'm glad to have this opportunity. So what goes on for the week is people take classes. Um, and it's about interacting and being with other lace makers. And for anyone who's ever had the opportunity to be with some other folks who get what you love to do, you get it. You know, I love being with stitchers. I love being with lace makers. That's what it is. Um, so I am taking, so the, the way the schedule works, it always starts with a Sunday evening, like kickoff dinner. And then um, there are class, there's a morning class slot and an afternoon class slot. Some people will take like just a morning class or just an afternoon class. Some people will take a, um, like will sign up for the same teacher and basically do all day with a teacher, like just work on the same thing. Um, I like to do two different classes because I like to take advantage as much as possible. And that said, those, those morning and afternoon classes are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. The break day of Wednesday allows for either um, trips, like a day trip, particularly when it's in a location you haven't been in. They make um, arrangements for special trips. Like I know one of them this year, part of the day is going to be at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which is a great museum. And in addition to having, you know, X amount of time just to wander around the museum on your own, they've also arranged a special behind the scenes visit with the lace collection, which is not something that's out. So that's what they do on the, on the day. And then there's a second option for a day trip. And I don't remember what that one is. Or on that Wednesday, they have one day classes. And um, so different people will choose to do different things on that Wednesday. And then the week ends on Friday evening with the banquet, it's the ending dinner. Um, I, I first went to this convention the first time I went was in 2011. It was in Bethesda, Maryland. It was just, I, while I was well into lace making, it was all just like a new experience. I went because it was within, within driving distance for me. And it was a cool experience. And I didn't know if I would go again. And then two years ago, just sort of all the stars aligned. <laughs> and I, it was the right thing to do. It was in Iowa. And um, that week I spent in Iowa was just like, magical. I don't know how else to say it. And I will, one thing I will say about that was it was also about the beauty that surrounds you. So the hotel was in, it was a fairly new hotel and it was in this fairly new, like almost like industrial complex. Like they were like, it was like a department store and there was like a building with offices and stuff and, and all, you know, restaurants were being built up sort of in the front part leading up to this main strip of, but the backside of it looked over a nature preserve. And it was the most gorgeous thing. And the, the what had happened, and I, I meant to look up the history so I could tell this correctly. Here's a phone again. I never get phone calls. Not on that phone, certainly. Um, there was a river not too far from the back of that hotel that had had terrible, terrible flooding. And this was about two or three years after Hurricane Katrina down in New Orleans. And what had happened in Iowa and places in the Midwest in those years after Hurricane Katrina was that um, there was some pretty amazing funding that came through because the, um, I'm not gonna say the words correctly, but it, as certainly as it was explained to me at the time was the idea that, hey, we did a really lousy job down in New Orleans. <laughs> Let's try and fix this area a little bit. Let's do a better job up here. The damage, the devastation was nowhere near. It's nowhere near that populated in that area. But some of the pictures of the flooding and then some of the pictures of what was done to help improve it were just phenomenal. Anyway, this hotel 
backed up against this nature preserve and there were these walkways and I was so lucky my hotel room was on that side of the hotel and that the whole way to walk to where the conference rooms where the classes were were these big giant windows and there really is something to be said about being surrounded by beauty like that and to me that location really contributed to how much I enjoyed that week so I I went into that while yes I had that first time in 2011 to me 2015 was like my real first convention I sort of felt like I really participated in all ways that I could I they have a display area and any it's like show and tell bring whatever you want and it gets put in display um, but there's also a lace contest and that year for the first time I entered the lace contest now the um, theme of the lace contest each year is a related to where the, the convention is. And it's called convention in the same way you would say, I'm going to retreat, you know, capital R retreat. It's just the word that gets used. So the theme for the convention in 2015 was nice and general. It was like, I'm not going to get, I should have pulled out a magazine to the wording of it. It's something like, um, It going to be in here. I'm not going to find this quickly, am I? It was basically, you're coming to Iowa, make something that's related to Iowa, related to the state flower. Oh, here we go. Lace on the prairie. The richest of Iowa and life on the American prairie is calling you for 2015. With the use of at least one color thread, be inspired by this beautiful part of the country. Your inspiration can come from amber waves of green, the indigenous people of the area, the beautiful wildflowers, or the unique prairie animals. Be inspired by this wonderful part of the country as you explore this contest theme. Nice and general. All kinds of things. I did. I was not the only one. So the um, state flower of Iowa is what's called the wild prairie rose. And this was my first time ever like designing a lace piece. And I entered it into the contest. Uh, it it didn't win anything. I was just glad to participate. It was just, it was very cool. Um, and it was nice to see, and maybe at some point next video when I'm more organized, um, to see different ways people had brought in Iowa to um, this. And what, um, in that beautiful nature preserve, I'm walking around and I'm seeing flowers and I'm like, that's a wild prairie rose. Like a wild prairie rose has very open petals. It's five petals and it's, it's a very open flower. It's not like a regular rose where the petals are closed upon. Like, because the research I had done to get like the right image to this, they're pink with a yellow like thing in the center. I could recognize the real flower. So at the previous year's convention, or you know, they announced the theme for the next year's convention. 2016 last year, the convention was in Indianapolis. And that it was just like in a general hotel, not in the downtown city area, just, you know, like in the outskirts. It was, it was fine. It just, it, it didn't have the beauty of space and that it's fine. You're still with people who enjoy what they're doing. Okay. But they make this announcement about the theme and you can almost hear in the room people going, huh? The theme was 200 because the state of Indiana was celebrating its bicentennial in 2016. They became a state in 1816. Your contest piece needed to incorporate 200 in any, um, how they phrase it, in any way you want it. So it could include the numerals 200, it could include 200 of something, you just, you needed to include a brief explanation of how your piece reflected the theme 200. And that's just, so I remember the plane ride home, like brainstorming to myself, what, what could I do? What could I do? And the idea that I ended up doing, I know was one of the first things I brainstormed. And it was also, I almost like immediately shot it down. I had this idea that I wanted to do a piece of lace with 200 colors in it. And the reason I shot it down almost immediately was because I didn't think I could get lace, a thread that is typically used for lace in 200 colors. And even if I could, I didn't want to buy 200 spools of a lace thread that I was just like never going to use again. And 
you know, I went through a few other thoughts and then, and then it occurred to me that, well, I do have a lot of red. DMC floss is not good for bobbin lace because floss is not tightly twisted. And with bobbin lace, you're typically tugging and it, I, I, there was one time I was trying to make a project with DMC floss and I just kept breaking threads. And that's just because of the tension, the way you work, but it's not impossible. And once my mind opened to that idea, could I do this with DMC floss? Well, that solved my 200 thread problem. So sh making a long story short, yeah, I did it. And here's my piece with 200 different colors and it's all DMC thread. And you all, Floss tube, cross stitcher, DMC people know that some DMC colors look awfully close to others, but you all know even those that look close to one another are really different. Um, each of those, I know they look like blobs to you. It's a stitch called a spider. And what I had to do was bring in four pairs of bobbins with that thread, do the spider, and then what's called throwing them out or putting them aside, actually cutting them off continue working. I had, well, I'll, I, so I was like really pleased when I came up with this. The design is simple. I mean, you could, you could see it's a, it's a, it's a not a complex piece of lace other than 200 colors in it. So last year at the convention, so the, the Friday night dinner, they, um, uh, one of the things is the announcement of the winners of the contest. And I was thrilled that this came in third place. But then I was even more thrilled when it won the People's Choice Award or the Popular Choice Award, which is to say the judges judged the lace and they gave it third place. But then everyone who's a, you know, a registered member of attending convention gets a you know, ballot and they choose what they like the best. And my piece won that, which was kind of cool. It was very cool. Um, the organization puts out a magazine four times a year. That's They don't allow pictures of the contest because the magazine reserves full, first right to do pictures. So I can't even show you other contest winners until they get published in the magazine. I'll, I could talk more about this in my next video, but I, let me just jump to this piece. So. Um, this didn't, it didn't shock me, but it was a surprise when I opened my mailbox and the winter issue, I was the cover model. And when I say it didn't surprise me, usually at least two out of the four issues are devoted. The cover is um, contest winners. And, and I mean, I suppose if I analyzed it, usually one is like the first place winner of the original design. There's two categories, original design and um, technical proficiency for like a pattern that's already been created and you're just being judged on how well you did it. Um, so usually one is like definitely a first place and if the first place winner didn't also win popular choice, it doesn't surprise me that, and that's why I wasn't shocked, but it was really kind of cool. And um, if you are trying to figure out how the heck did she do that, so, I mean, I, you have to also submit like your pattern, like you're required to, like, this is the pattern, the pricking, and this was the article that I, or the, you know, the writing that I wrote and the explanation. And I also submitted some pictures and, um, depending on, and, and that's what it looked like. There's all my bobbins. It took, um, 128 pairs, so 256 bobbins of like the, the off-white accru plus the four pairs of a color, use them, throw them out, bring them back in over and over and over 200 times. Um, so that's a couple of pictures of what it looked like in progress. So if you're following along, you may be wondering, Arlene, did you make a piece for this year's contest? And the answer is, well, yeah, I made two pieces. You're only allowed to enter one piece per category, but there's two categories. One is original design, one is technical proficiency. Um, they're already mailed in. I just have to say, I'm just so not pleased with how they turned out. 
And when I was working on one of them a few weeks ago, I actually filmed a snippet of myself that I was going to insert in a floss tube at some appropriate time, just as another bobbin lace demo for you guys. Because um, I knew that at a point when I'd be filming a floss tube, I wouldn't be in a good place with the lace. And so maybe the next video, like after convention, when I have the piece back, I'll insert that little snippet. This is already way too long. I'll insert that snippet, and then I'll also have the finished piece. And I'll, I'll show you why it's not that good. And I'll show you what's wrong with the other piece as well. And I, it's like those of you, I think about Julie McConnell and the State Fair, and those of you, and I believe in participation. Um, sure, I had for but for different reasons. Both of those pieces, I thought this is embarrassing. I should not send these even in. I'm like, no, participation. I'm gonna send these in. Yeah, some people really knew me last year for my 200, but I'm just participating this year. So, the other part that I'm looking forward to is that. Just especially because it's closer and because I've had two years of really good experiences, I have volunteered to do a lot of volunteer things next week. I couldn't, I'm a member of the Liberty Lacers, which is the host group. Um, I couldn't commit during the school, during personal life of the last year, school year, but personal life, I couldn't commit or envision um, like being head of a committee related to this convention. Um, but by the fall time, I connected with one member in particular and said, I would love to be your helper. And as I, you know, really got connected in the springtime with her, and I said, I'm serious about that. I, I want to be a volunteer and not just like one two-hour slot. She said, great, great. And I said, I want to be your minion. <laughs> Tell me what to do. And she sent me this list of, of like 10 things or 10 like slot, whatever it was. Well, these are the various things that I know I'm going to need any help. You know, let me know which you think you might be able to do. And I wrote her back and said, I'm doing all of them for you. I told you I want to be your minion. And she was so grateful. So I'm, I'm looking forward to being helpful. That makes a difference to me. And separate from that, I've also um, volunteered myself to organize a lunch that, um, just a gathering. There's a group called Arachne, uh, like spider Arachne, that has been online for like the beginning of the, since the internet, um, before Facebook, before social media groups, before, before Yahoo and, and Google groups could happen. Um, a lot of ways that this kind of interaction could happen was through a listserv group. And this listserv still exists, and it's called Arachne. And it's the one time a year that those who still belong to uh, Arachne try to get together in person. And a message went out saying, is anyone in Liberty Lacers that could think about organizing this? And I just decided, you know what? Again, I want to give back. So I'm glad to be a part of that as well. So I'm, I'm glad that next week is going to be about learning some new things. And I'll wait till afterwards and share with you because I'm already, uh, it's already talking too much. Uh, I'll wait till afterwards to talk, to share with you more about my classes and, and, and that piece. But I'm also glad that I'm going to be giving and hopefully making it a good convention experience for some other folks. So if you're still with me at this point, thank you so much. I'll repeat what I started with. I love Floss Tube. I love the community we have here. I so appreciate all of you. I love the comments. I love the interactions. Um, I hope you have a great week. I will be back after convention. Take care.